Members, we will now move on to questions uh, of the Minister of Health. And I call Jim Allister to ask the first question. Mr Allister. Question 1. Uh, a department has no power to prevent any citizen, including a civil servant, from bringing legal proceedings in his or her own name, as the member himself will be especially aware the outcome is then a matter for the courts. Before I invite Mr Allister for his supplementary, members will be aware of reports that judicial review proceedings are ongoing. And before we begin, I want to advise members of the need to take care in their supplementary questions. It really is the onus on members to exercise caution in any supplementary questions to ensure that they do not refer to the substance of those proceedings and to ensure that those proceedings are not prejudiced. And I call Jim Allister for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I take cognizance of your um, direction. The Minister will be aware that this touches upon a matter very close to the heart of the still grieving parents of Claire Roberts, who will be listening and watching in respect of this matter. So can I ask the Minister, does his department fully accept the findings of the O'Hara inquiry into hyponatremia? which included a finding that Professor Ian Young, who reviewed the case of Claire Roberts, had identified failings in the fluid management of Claire, but failed to inform the family and the coroner of this fact, and instead provided misleading information that was intended to protect the hospital and the doctors. How then? Is it tenable for that person to continue to hold a key public-facing role with that finding as the voice of the Department of Matters of Great Public Health Importance? Taking what the, the Speaker has said into consideration, the Member will be aware that I and my department have accepted all 96 recommendations that are in the Justice O'Hara report. Um, in the introduction of the report, Mr Justice Zahara recorded important caveats in relation to individuals who were criticised by his reports. He stated the public inquiry process is investigative and inquisitorial and seeks to discern what has happened in order to better identify what may be learned. Accordingly, and this is his quote, I have found myself in a very different position to a judge sitting in a court of law. In identifying what has gone wrong, I have inevitably criticised some individuals and organisations, but my findings are not binding and are not de detrimentative of liability. He further made clear, I am conscious that the individuals who are criticised were not able to defend themselves as they might in adversarial proceedings and were subscribed in their right to make representations. I am also aware that individuals who are criticised may attract adverse publicity, affecting both reputation and career. Therefore, where critical comment is made of an individual, it must be assessed in the context of the limitations of the process. Um, could I ask the Minister if he has any update on the hyponatremia work streams and when he expects they will be due for completion? Thank you. Um, and I thank the member for, for her supplementary. As she knows, there are nine work streams and seven subgroups that were established within an overarching project to link the work required to implement the recommendations of the inquiry into the hyperintunia related deaths. The work streams and subgroups are duty of candor, death certification, duty of quality, paediatric clinical collaborative, uh, serious adverse incidents training, user experience and advocacy, workforce and professional regulation and assurance. I want the recommendations implemented fully but without unintended consequences. To do this, I have gathered together over 200 people from different backgrounds to work through how best to implement the recommendations. They include service users and carers, the voluntary and community sector, and people from health and social care organisations. This co-production approach will help ensure that the changes we make work in practice. Paul Kelly Armstrong. Question number four. Um, Sorry, just bear with me a wee second. We thought you had stood for a supplementary, so 
Question. Morris Bradley, a call. Mr. Speaker, question two. Um, thank you, Speaker. Uh, with your permission, I'll group questions two, seven, ten, and fourteen. And with your indulgence, I would like uh, some latitude to provide a more thorough answer. The plan for deploying the vaccines is well underway and has been designed to be pragmatic, agile, and flexible. The programme started on the 8th of December and, by close of play yesterday, uh, 246,421 vaccines had been administered. This includes 221,809 first doses and 24,612 second doses. The deployment plans involves a mixture of delivery models. Most people aged 80 years and over should now have been invited to receive their first dose or have been advised that they can expect to receive the vaccine. Housebound patients on the GP register who are over 80 will be vaccinated by GPs working in conjunction with their district nurse and colleagues. In addition, those care home residents not vaccinated by mobile teams will also receive the vaccine from a district nurse working with their GP practice. GPs will regularly check the records to ensure none of their patients in the eligible cohorts has missed out on an offer of vaccination. The vaccination of priority groups 1 and 2 has largely been completed, and the GP programme is currently working through the vaccination of priority groups 3 to 4, those aged 70 to 79, as well as those individuals deemed clinically extremely vulnerable. GPs will be in touch to invite individuals in groups 3 and 4 to come to receive the vaccine and for the vast majority of individuals, no further action is required. However, for anyone in groups one or two who still has not been contact, contacted from their GP, I would suggest they contact their practice to check the position. Vaccination wastage has been incredibly small, which is due entirely to the professionalism and dedication of the pharmacy staff. Vaccinators and GP staff have managed to keep it so low it is currently est estimated that less than 0.5 per cent. That is much lower than a normal vaccination programme and ensures that the vast majority of the precious resource, which is the vaccine, is being given to those who need it most. The rollout of the vaccination programme is, of course, dependent on a steady supply of vaccine. We are part of the UK-wide procurement process, which should ensure the UK has access to up to 367 million doses. Northern Ireland will receive 2.85% of all the available COVID vaccines in the UK. And as members will be aware, the UK was the first country in the world to authorise the deployment of a COVID-19 vaccine. JCVI has identified the best option for preventing mortality and morbidity initially is to protect those most at risk, namely those persons falling within priority groups 1 to 9. And as such, the vaccination plan has been targeted towards specific age cohorts of the population most at risk. The vaccination plan, therefore, does not measure deployment against overall population numbers. However, vaccination deployment is an ongoing programme and subject primarily to the availability of vaccine. Therefore, this means average weekly rate is likely to change and increase as larger cohorts of the population come forward to be vaccinated. Well, Mark Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much to the Minister for his very his, for his detailed answers. But, Minister, I make reference to an 87-year-old constituent who was invited to attend a, vac a vaccination session at the Joy de Lop Centre in Ballymoney. My constituent is housebound and in isolation, as is his daughter. Neither have any means to get to Ballymoney. The man like many, and many like him are in need of a home visit. They have contacted their local health centre, but so far they have not heard any further word on a schedule for vaccination. Minister, it is people like this who may be falling through the net that we need to be clear and have clear advice and guidance for to ensure everyone called for vaccination is dealt with in a timely fashion. I thank the member for, for his question. And as I said, the housebound patients on the GP register um, who are over 80 will be vaccinated by GPs working in conjunction with their district nursing colleagues. So the member's constituent will be got to, will be got to uh, in a timely manner. And if the member wants to forward on details of the practice or the constituents, I will happily follow it up. John Bundy. Thank you, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his answers. What consideration has he given to establishing a standby list whereby people, for example, carers, sand teachers, PSNI, anybody in frontline contact with the most at risk groups uh, can come in at short notice to fill any gaps there may be? Thank you. Um, and I thank the member for her question. As you will know, we've moved now into region using our regional centres for those 65 to 69 cohort 
who are being brought forward on appointment basis. So those, I can assure you there's very few people missing out in those appointments, so there's not necessary to have that standby list. Should we have any vaccine that has come to the end of its usability or its shelf life, we're actually calling forward a small cohort of health and social care workers to receive their second dose so we can move on with that programme. Commissioner Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. But following on from the previous question, and I, and I do appreciate the Minister has been thorough, but thankfully the waste has been low, and that has been due to the fact that the reserve list or the standby list have been staff who are readily available to turn up on site. But has the Minister any plans to make sure there is a consistent approach across all GP practices to ensure that the reserve lists are built up in a similar fashion and that they're accessed in a, in a quick and speedy way by those who need it. And I, I thank the member for her question. I think we're working with, I think, in the region of 321 GP practices who are rolling out uh, that vaccination programme uh, to the, uh, the elderly cohorts and those who are clinically extremely vulnerable as well. So again, they're calling forward patients to fill specific time slots, so it's not the first come, first serve basis. So most of those slots are being taken up by people who are actually being called forward rather than having any service left at the end of the day. Call Linda Dillon. Can call you. Minister, thank you for your answer so far. But we have been contacted by a number of GP surgeries, particularly in the Northern and Southern Trust, Northern Trust in particular, that are saying they are not re receiving sufficient numbers of vaccine in order to be able to vaccinate those over 70s, 80s and 90s whilst obviously we have the programme for the 65 to 69 year olds, which is very welcome, but we then have this very vulnerable group who feel that they're not being prioritised. Can you let us know what you're going to do to address that? Um, and I think to, to clarify for the member, although people talk about our vaccination programme, we're running a twin track programme, and that's because of the, the particular peculiarities of both vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine is one that still has to be stored at minus 70 to minus 80, so that's why it's being used specifically through our our regional centres, and I think, as, as Mr. Bradley highlighted earlier on, we're using that younger cohort, well, young, you know, the 65 to 69, so we are more mo mobile, more agile, can actually go to that. So the GP practices are picking up the other cohorts as well. In regards to the supply of the AstraZeneca vaccine, as soon as we get a delivery, it's put out to the GPs. It doesn't sit in our, st our central stores for any period of time. There will be incidents where they receive a batch which isn't enough to complete a full cohort of a specific age group. But what I would say to those GP practices is mega start. You don't have to wait until you have enough vaccine to do the entirety of the cohort. If the member wants to, uh, to give me details of GP practices, I can get back to her uh, with how much that GP practice uh, actually received and when they received it, because we're keeping very tight eye on the amount of vaccines that each of them received, plus the returns uh, that they are putting in in regards to the number of, of patients that they are vaccinating as well, to make sure we're getting maximum use out of the vaccine that we are distributing. Call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for his answers. Does the Minister agree with me that the EU Commission, in apparent desperation to cover up their own vaccine procurement failings, should never have brought potential future supplies of this life-saving vaccine into the realms of such a contentious political debate uh, over the flawed protocol arrangements? Um, and, and I thank the Member for the point. I know there has been uh, much discussion uh, over this issue since the EU triggered Article 16 on, on Friday. Um, this, Mr Speaker, actually had very real or potentially very real implications um, for ourselves because we had vaccine actually in transit. And had that article been enforced, we may have seen difficulties in the supply and the arrival of vaccines here in Northern Ireland. So while, while there was the noise being made on Friday evening, I would like to pay uh, tribute to those officials within my department who were working vigorously behind the scenes to make sure that that deployment and that dispatch of vaccines actually arrived here on Friday night and was able then fit to be distributed um, through uh, our practices on our vaccination centres. Vaccine is not something that should become political. We've been very clear in the last, over the last year that in regards to how we fight COVID-19, it's not about politics, it's about saving lives. Well, Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, um, carers, as you know, have been um, 
living through um, the most um, anxious times over the last year, and many of them are contacting their GP surgeries to find out when they'll be called forward for the vaccines, and they're being told that they're not still not a priority group. I asked Patricia Donnelly two weeks ago if she could produce a, a leaflet specifically for care, so they are not having to go to the GP practices. Can you please issue a statement to give them clarity on when they will be called forward? Thank you. And I thank the member, and, and just to, to be clear, it's not uh, that carers are not a priority. They are. They do come in the priority ma matrix uh, that has been established by JCVI. So we are working our way through the criteria that have been left out uh, by the JCVI in order of risk. So we will be getting to them. I know Patricia uh, took on board uh, your ask the last health committee and is working on that so we can get that reassurance out to carers that we will get to them. Now, we need to be... We need to be clear that we are still in the early days of this vaccine programme, so, uh, and we are dependent on vaccine supplies as well of the two, two vaccines that have currently been approved and we haven't stuck. So as more vaccines come online, more get approval, we will be able to accelerate even further those vaccines and those, those priority groupings as well. So we'll certainly put out the, that, that clarity or that reformation that the, the members asked for. Nicole Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister, question number three. Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, and as he know, um, the unfortunate reality is that Northern Ireland Health Service was already struggling uh, to meet demand for elective services well before the pandemic. We simply did not have the workforce, uh, particularly the nursing workforce, to be able to provide sufficient elective and unscheduled care at times of pressure. And as a result of the prevailing COVID situation, an even greater number of staff have been absent or have had to be redeployed to meet the urgent and immediate needs of extremely ill patients requiring urgent treatment. The Chief Nursing Officer has requested the Northern Ireland Practice Education Council for Nursing undertake a project, undertake a project into the priority of nursing careers in response uh, to the recognised number of nursing vacancies within the particular area of practice. The purpose of the project is to promote uh, preoperative nursing and develop a career pathway to develop support and develop of registered and non-registered nursing staff. The member will also be aware that we reopened the workforce appeal in an effort to build capacity with particular fo focus on certain roles and positions across hospitals and community care. This is a short-term fix and only delivers a temporary solution. We need to fix the problem of a permanent, on a permanent basis with newly trained and qualified people appointed to permanent positions. The record number of pre-registration nursing and midwifery training places commissioned this year includes the additional 300 indicated under New Decade New Approach. It will take three years of training before these students can be registered to practice, and these additional nurses require an investment of some £38 million over a six- to seven-year period. Tackling our unacceptable waiting lists will not be possible without sustained and substantial investment and additional staffing. And I have made it clear that this must be a major executive priority in 2021 and beyond. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. I want to publicly thank all key workers, especially the healthcare workers in the front line. I know that your announcement last week about a recognition payment to health workers was very welcome. Can a minister please clarify if this will include all agency and zero hour contract staff? And could the minister provide a time frame for the payment? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member and I thank his acknowledgement uh, for, the, for the support that has been made and offered. We are still working with our, our trade union colleagues and all our stakeholders as well to the clarity and the detail of some of the, the specifics around that cohort as well to show uh, that they are a valued part of our workforce as well. So that is a bit of the ongoing work in relation to, to that, that, that support of, and that acknowledgement because it is only... It is only a small acknowledgement. Uh, the monies that for our permanent workforce are there in regards to the HSC staff. Uh, I have that within my budget. The Finance Minister uh, give uh, a credence to the ministerial direction that I have issued. So that should be working through our way through payments and processes very shortly. Nicole Liz Gimmins. And um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, as you'll know, retaining our skilled nurses and other healthcare professionals are just as important as recru recruiting and training more. Um, can you outline what new initiatives has your department undertaken to support staff uh, to stay in post, including, for example, a regional menopause policy? Um, 
I, I thank the member for, for her question, and I'll, and I'll be quite honest with in the last point, that is not something that has been brought to my attention or come, uh, come across my desk, but I can assure the member now that she has raised it. It is something I will raise with our workforce directorate um, and the chief nursing officer, because contributions made in this House do help and shape uh, the way we go forward and the way my, my department takes, takes overall policy. But I do want maybe just to highlight something that the overall vacancy rate for registered, especially registered nursing admin free staff, at the end of September 2020 was 7.4 per cent. That's unacceptably high. But back uh, to this level, actually last, and that's equivalent to the level last seen uh, on March 2017. But it's a major improvement from the peak vacancy, uh, which was a 13.1 per cent recorded in June of last year. So the recruitment and retention is actually something that, that is ongoing. We have put in those additional supports that have been more um, focused on support during the pandemic rather than specifically on retention. But in the issue that the member has raised is one I certainly raise within the department and I thank her for that. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Minister, um, uh, I welcome your, your, your remarks in regards to our, our nurse, nursing workforce who do need to be valued uh, and they do need to be recognised. But would the minister agree with me that we must not forget about our non-clinical staff, the cleaners, the porters, the chefs, uh, the laundry workers, who without them our NHS couldn't do what they're doing. And uh, I thank the member for his point, and I think that is one of the, the things I've done um, as Minister come in, is making sure that we value and recognise all our workforce within the health and social care system. Because the unfortunate language that has been used uh, even a couple of weeks ago in regards to the differential between frontline and backroom, I think was disappointing and derogatory to many. Because without those backroom staff, as they were so termed, uh, the front line couldn't work. So to me as Minister, each one is a vital part, a vital cog in our overhaul health service and how we actually support patients as they go through their, 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 their clinical pathway and the medical supports that they need. So without any of the individuals that the member recognised, nothing could work within our health service. So, so I value them all equally and, and appreciate the work that they do, um, often unrecognised because they are often in the background making the entirety of the machine work. Nicole Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Obviously, in terms of staffing, um, uh, illness and self isolation is also uh, a problem, and we're hearing more and more about the increased um, levels of new variants of COVID 19 in Northern Ireland. And given uh, the fact that it's been announced that door to door testing for the South Africa variant is to start in England, are, are you, as Minister, uh, looking to uh, plan to do similar here in Northern Ireland? Um, I, I thank uh, the member, and to be quite honest, before coming into the chamber, I hadn't heard of the door-to-door -door testing um, for, for the variant, but it is something that our party colleague, uh, Mr Newton, raised as soon as, as soon as he sat down, as soon as, as, soon as I sat down, because he, he had his ear, to, his ear to the ground. It's not something, but it's something we will, we will follow up in regards to the utilisation of our testing centres as to how we best position those. Uh, in regards, if it has been used door to door in any specific region, I would be concerned just because there's maybe a concern that there is a breakout or a, a hotspot of that variant in that particular geographical area. Something, fortunately, that we have yet to see in Northern Ireland. Next question, Kelly Armstrong. Question number four. And I thank the member for her question. It remains my department's position that care home visiting can be safely facilitated through compliance with the regional principles for visiting in care settings, which are clearly set out in the existing guidance. We encourage all involved to work together to ensure that care home residents can avail of visits from their friends and families while maintaining a safe environment. The decision to permit visitors into a care home and how this is organised remains the responsibility of the care home manager. Such discussions should be based on a dynamic risk assessment, taking into account the particular circumstances of the individual care home in order to ensure the safety of all residents and visitors. Health and social care trusts have been asked to work with care homes to provide the support that they might require to, provide, to move forward with risk assessments that facilitate safe, managed and meaningful visiting arrangements and the implementation of the care partner concept. In addition, the public health agency are working with relevant stakeholders to continue to support the processes for implementation of meaningful visiting and the care partner concept. 
I fully understand why some care homes remain cautious about implementing both fizzing arrangements and the care partner concept based on their experiences to date of managing the transmission and the impact of COVID-19. Nevertheless, there is um, and an appreciation of the right uh, to a family life for those living in care home settings, and in particular to acknowledge the critical importance of sustaining relationships between residents and their family and friends, particularly at this time of year. It is clear that there are a significant number of families who feel that they have not been able to visit their relatives or set up care partner arrangements in line with regional guidance. Some of the stories told by families are deeply concerning, and we know that they do not reflect the sector as a whole and appreciate how hard many homes have been working to facilitate both the care partner concept and safe visiting arrangements between residents and their friends or families. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. And I do thank you and um, all of the colleagues within the health service um, for taking this, this forward. But I'm just wanting to ask, um, and thank you very much for the risk assessments, as we know they will be key. But could you outline how um, you have sought to communicate and promote this to potential care partners to ensure that they are all following guidelines, aware of it, and able to let people know so that the visiting can happen safely? And, and I, thank the, you know, I thank the member for, for that critical point. One, one of the pieces of work we, we have been doing has actually been led by Patient Client Council in regards to supporting uh, especially families who have experienced difficulty uh, in accessing some homes due to, well, some homes that have been supported by the guidance, by the supports that we have given, but also uh, in regards to how they implement even the care partner arrangements as well. So we've asked the, the Patient Client Council to lead that piece of work as an independent body interacting uh, between ourselves and the families who have, been, who have been affected. Some very harrowing stories, and I'm sure the members have, have received, I'm sure most members have received through their constituency office as well. But many examples of good practice as well have been put out there by good homes as well. So I want to put on record my thanks for, to those homes uh, who are doing that extra piece of work to make sure that visiting can, be, can proceed safely uh, and risk, risk, uh, with less risk. It will never be risk-free, but with less risk than some of the homes. So that, that ongoing piece of work and engagement is ongoing. And uh, my the Chief Nursing Officer, Chief Social Worker, met with the Patient Client Council and a number of family representatives uh, within the last couple of weeks to discuss some of the particular difficulties with certain homes in certain regions as to how they take what should be should be an offer of support uh, and encouragement that comes from my department as to how we actually facilitate uh, visiting for families and residents. Emma Rogan, supplementary. Yeah, but can call you. Minister, um, just on the subject of visiting arrangements and, and limitations, um, which have been a constant source of worry and emotional, uh, an emotional turmoil for staff, patients and for relatives, can the Minister outline if the current restrictions on visiting, for example, in maternity wards, um, setting, settings will likely to change? I thank the member for, for her question. And I kind of welcome her to the, the Health Committee as well and look forward to, to, to working with her. The updated vision guidance, which came into effect from the 15th of January, outlines that the specific restrictions for each care setting are aligned to the pandemic surge levels and the R value. So this represents the risk of the virus spreading from one infected person to another. And on average, the guidance is based on the best scientific advice available at any given time. Northern Ireland is currently in surge level five, which states that in maternity settings, uh, a birth partner will be facilitated to accompany the pregnant woman to date scan, early pregnancy clinic, anomaly scan, fetal medicine department, uh, when admitted to an individual room for active labour, and that will be determined by, by their midwife on, on birth. So the decision to permit visitors into a facility on a day-to-day -day basis will still lie with the nurse in charge and be based on a risk assessment and the ability to ensure social distancing and safety of both patients and visiting. This is not the experience I would hope for expected mothers, and I recognise this is a very anxious time for all families. Many difficult requests have been and will continue to be made um, of the public around all aspects of the health service provision in order to reduce the spread of infection and to protect expected mothers, their families and the staff providing the care. Call Mark Dorgan. Thank you very much, Elgood. I can call you and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The Minister has quite rightly identified the challenges in care homes as regards visits and I suppose the extra burden that that puts on staff, who in many cases now are, are, are almost substitute 
uh, families, for the, the people under their care. Given that the, so many of our care homes are independently owned, can uh, the Minister give an assurance to those hard-working and heroic staff in our care homes that they will also be eligible for the recognition payment, the very welcome recognition payment that he announced last week? Um, I, I thank the member uh, f f for his question, and there is a piece of work going on in regards to stakeholders within the independent sector as to how we actually carry forward that recognition payment um, so it can be properly utilised and get to the people who are most deserving. That ends the period for list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Orlea Flynn. And Minister, maybe just to bring it back to, I know you touched on the vaccinations um, earlier in question time, but just on that same point, um, uh, so um, what I'm thinking about, we've obviously been dealing with different queries of people falling through the gaps and the housebound was referenced. Um, I'm also thinking about people in community hospitals and people who aren't actually registered with um, a GP. Is there any sort of reassurances that you can give to those groups of people um, just to ensure that they don't miss out somewhere along the line in the vaccination programme? Thank you. In regards to anyone who's not registered with a GP, I would encourage them to do it. Uh, in regards to uh, access of vaccine, I, I suggest they do go forward and make themselves known um, to their local GP or get in touch with the Health and Social Care Board so they do, do it on. There, there's no danger or harm being registered uh, with your, your local gen, gen GP as well, and even uh, out with uh, provision of, of the vaccine as well. In regards to those people who are in hospital and come, uh, they'll not fall through the track cracks because the GPs working with the hospital clinicians will make sure that they are put onto a vaccination list and are covered as well. Supplementary, Orlea Flynn. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and then just to follow on from uh, Paula had made the point around the, the curves and the prioritisation within the vaccination programme and we've also been receiving lobbies as, as you'll know from um, teachers within special school settings. So I know that the GCVA have come out and they had stated that those decisions around um, prioritisation that there are policy decisions and I'm just wondering Minister if you could outline then you know the role that you would play in designing how we prioritise um, our vaccination programme. Thank you. Um, and I thank the member you know, for the topic that she raises. One of the very clear directions from JCVI is the direction of travel and the priority risks, uh, especially to those higher groups as well. So that's why we're being very uh, strict and stringent um, as to the phases that we've taken in phase one and phase two of our vaccination programme. And I think the member has seen that. It's been widely, widely publicised uh, and also has been brought to light and communicated through the, the, the health committee as well in regards to accessing different groups and different priority groups as they come. Uh, JCVI is currently working uh, and looking at, at that and what they're doing as far as, as we're led to believe is actually looking at the, the risk base of certain professions uh, once they move out, once we get through uh, those age groups and the clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, in regards to the, the special school staff that the member did mention, there has been ongoing uh, conversations between uh, my department and uh, the education department as well in regards to looking at those staff working in special schools who do fit or may fit uh, the criteria that also uh, aligns with the caring role of domiciliary care workers, of hospital workers as well. So if there is an alignment that we can see closely aligns to what has been recommended by JCVI, we will move in that direction. I call Andy Allen. Mr. Speaker, Minister, uh, I very much welcome your statement last, or your announcement last week to award a 500 payment uh, to staff and a 2001 off payment to students as uh, recognition for their sterling work throughout this pandemic. Minister, are you able to advise at this stage uh, how many staff and students will receive this payment? Um, I, I, I thank the member for, for, for his point. It's a valid one and still uh, considering the, the the extent of our health and social care family across Nor Northern Ireland. At this stage, um, I would be looking at approximately 3,850 students um, and almost 75,000 directly employed um, health and social care staff, 33,500 independent sector care workers, and about 20,000 others, which actually includes primary care um, and community pharmacy. 
Andy Allen, supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. And Minister, uh, as I have highlighted, I very much welcome the payment, but I have been contacted by many of those within this sector who also welcome the payment. But more importantly, Minister, are you aware of any uh, steps the Finance Minister is taking in consultation with Treasury uh, and the Communities Minister in, in respect of income tax and Social Security uh, payments to ensure that the maximum amount of this uh, money remains in the pockets of those who deserve and are entitled to this payment? And also, furthermore, are you able to give an indication as to the overall cost of this um, I'll, I'll maybe start with, with the member's second point um, first. In regards to the student uh, recognition payment, um, it will cost in the region of seven and a half million pounds. Uh, the five hundred pound payment for directly employed health and social care staff uh, will cost roughly forty four million pounds. Uh, we've set aside ten million for primary care and approximately a further fifteen million uh, for the independent care sector. Uh, however, as I've said earlier in, in other answers, the, the latter especially is subject to some change uh, given the breadth of, of work and partners involved and the engagements we're currently having with, with stakeholders. In regards to, uh, I suppose, communication between the Finance Minister and the Community Ministers, uh, I have been in contact with both. Both have responded positively, positively uh, that they will engage with their Westminster counterparts to see what can be done, as the member will know, due to the working arrangements of, of this place and our executive. I can uh, contact either Finance or Treasury directly or Department of Work and Pensions. It goes through the relevant departmental and the relevant ministers. So I'm aware that both ministers of communities and finance are supportive of making those approaches to make sure as much of this money as possible actually reaches uh, the pockets of those that it is intended to do. Call General Dowd. We yeah, thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, in, in an earlier response to Pan Cameron in regards to the proposed door-to-door -door testing for the South African variant in England, uh, you said that uh, you weren't aware of it or you hadn't heard the news in that regard, which, which raises another question. Has the Department of Health in England notified your department that their concerns are at such a serious level that they're going to have to now take extraordinary measures? As I said, and I think the member picked up on what I said earlier, I hadn't heard the conversation, or I don't know what the announcement actually is in regards to what's going on in door-to-door -door, uh, testing in regards to that particular variant. But we have good communications between all departments um, across these islands in regards to what's happening, and specifically uh, in regards to different variants as, as they do present themselves. So, uh, as I said to the member, I'll check up on this as soon as this piece of item is finished, and also uh, the debate that follows this as well. John uh, thank you, Ken Cody. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, Minister, in regards to travel restrictions across the island, and it has been rehearsed many, many times, but in, in regards to the specific issue of hopefully, well, when it arises in terms of hotel quarantine for uh, incoming passengers, does the Minister agree that it should be coordinated on an all island basis as part of the two island approach to tackling uh, COVID 19? In regards to, to the two island approach, in regards to the hotel quarantine, and I'd certainly be, be supportive of that, uh, and specifically working on a, on a Five Nations basis as to how, how we actually progress that. There is a quad meeting this afternoon, which is ourselves, Secretary of State, um, and government officials from, or government ministers from the Republic of Ireland, where I'm sure this issue uh, will be raised. Um, I would say that we are, and the member will be aware, there were concerns in regards to the data sharing of the passenger locator form information. That work is still ongoing. We hope to be in a, a resolution as to how that data can be shared, because the member knows that if we're not getting that information from people landing in Dublin Airport, there is a weakness then as to what steps we actually take here in Northern Ireland as well. So we do need that uh, two islands approach, I think, as the member rightly um, acknowledged in his question. Well, Jerry Carl. Uh, can the Minister give an update on any recent work uh, done by his department or consideration done by his department to look at bringing care homes into public ownership so they are uh, not for private profit but under the, the guise of the NHS via departments or uh, trusts? Um, I, I thank the member for his point and I know it is something he raised in his contribution to the, the debate um, earlier on today. It is not something that we have actively uh, looked at um, due to the costs uh, associated. I do, and the member does know that even um, with the politi political differences that, that we do have, uh, the support for those people in the health care service working in those homes, I've often said they are the Cinderella service um, of our health care service and they do need more, more recognition 
and there is a significant piece of work being led by my senior social worker in regards to some of the, the recommendations and communications uh, that were brought forward in the committee's report. The member will know it's an ongoing piece of work that I, I, have, I, I have brought forward and have asked to be brought forward to make sure that those people working in care homes are valued and appreciated and recognised. Terry Carl, supplementary. Thank you, thank the Minister for his answer, and I appreciate that the Minister uh, could share with uh, the House or myself the, the costs uh, that he referred to. Uh, would the Minister ac accept that the current model, which does prioritise profit at all costs, is not only unsustainable and unfair, uh, but one which puts um, residents, workers, uh, and the public um, potentially at risk? Um, I, I, I would say, you know, and it's something the member raised in the contribution. Uh, to the debate earlier on in regards to challenging me about how much free PPE we give to some of these care home providers where they are making um, and sometimes where they are making extensive profits even during, during the pandemic. What I will say to the member, I would rather have been supplying them with PPE than seeing those workers, the residents, actually go short of the PPE that they needed as well. There is, there is a piece of work and the member as well, as well knows, he has heard me say this, in regards to the regulation and the conduct of some of those care home providers as well as to how they actually support not just the residents nor their staff but also the families of the residents as well as to how they access loved ones and how they make sure that there is a consistency of, of approach and support uh, for all residents no matter what home or whose ownership it actually comes under. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask if the Minister would care to comment on the issue of former RQIA officials who have recently resigned, taking up posts with private care home providers, some with uh, high reported incidents of COVID and numbers of deaths, on which those same officials may have previously written reports? Um, I, I think I, I'd be unwilling to, to comment on any specific named individual who has sought employment um, after leaving the employee of the RQIA. It's not, a, it's not an area I want to get into in this chamber. John Blair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for, for the, the answer. Um, can I ask more broadly, then, if the Minister agrees that there should be strict governance structures, perhaps even a stipulated time lapse between service done by public servants in an inspectoral role and moving into a related business area in the private sector? I, I, again, I think, as, as someone earlier on, it is not something that I previously considered or brought into. To, to my train of thought, or had come across my desk, I know we are looking into how care homes and the provision are being regulated. It is, if it is something that does come up um, in those discussions, it's certainly something that I would, I would take cognizant of uh, if it is brought forward due to that, that review of regulations and, and decision-making process as to how that would be carried forward. But it's not something that I'm currently working on, just to inform the member. Call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, would he join with the Minister for Education in the Minister for Education's call for teachers, and particularly special educational needs teachers, to receive the vaccine? Um, I think, as I indicated in an earlier answer, the, the, my department and the Education Department, and myself and um, the Education Minister, I think, spoke about this about 10 o'clock last night. So there is ongoing engagement between the support uh, that we can provide in the vaccination programme, keeping within the confines of the JCVI recommendation and being able to vaccinate some special care school staff. Uh, and I, I leave it at that. I think there is the ongoing work should lead to a joint announcement at least being made sometime today, if not tomorrow, in regards to how that work has actually progressed. Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister has actually answered my uh, second question, indeed, that it would be encouraging if those who are engaged, uh, particularly with the special needs uh, children, could indeed receive that news as best possible, as quickly as possible, through whatever particular channels the Minister decides. Um, and I, I think uh, what I'll say to the, the, the member, um, those staff would be the responsibility of the Education Minister. So I'd leave it up to him to make that uh, announcement to them. Um, the one thing the Minister of Education has never done is, is, is push his way into my department or any of my, my announcements, so I'll not be doing likewise. But I, what I will say, there has been an intense piece of work that has taken place um, in regards to this issue, even over the weekend. So I'd like to commend officials from both departments uh, who have been working on this to bring it to, to a resolution uh, in regards to what staff within special schools could actually receive the vaccination. 
My call Liz Kimmins, and you may only get time for a question. Gormaga, can I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, Minister, I welcome the, the announcement last week in terms of the, the payment in recognition um, of unpaid carers and their contribution through this pandemic, and something that I have spoken to before, and I know a number of my colleagues have as well. Can the Minister outline when this payment will be expected for unpaid carers, or what stage it's at? I want to be very clear to the member. This is one of the payments that has proven the mo most difficult um, for us to progress in regards to how we may actually make the definition. Um, I have a meeting tomorrow afternoon with a number of carers organisations as to how we, we actually define that role as well, where we take the register from, and how we progress that payment as well. And it is something um, that I will have to get back, and I will go back to the, the member's party colleague, the Minister of Communities, as well, as to see if there may be, even be something that we have to do jointly. Uh, so we do recognise uh, those providing unpaid care and make sure that we do get that, that, that recognition to them as well. And time is up. Thank you. Could I ask members to take a raise for a moment or two, please? Thank you.